Hey, good morning. Uh, let's start. So today is um, Brains in a Vat. Uh, Putnam's article, Brains in a Vat. And um, the question, how, how do you know that the causes of your experience are what you take them to be? This is the classical philosophical problem of skepticism. And it really illustrates uh, the general model that if you get the stuff that we've been talking about, about the theory of meaning, about the theory of reference, if you get that stuff right, then um, classical philosophical problems are dealt with very rapidly. Um, so it's actually a fairly straightforward to address skepticism, given the material we've had already. But I want to begin with another basic question. Um, that's really going to frame a lot of what we do in the next three weeks or so, which is reductionism about meaning. Explaining what meaning is in terms that don't presuppose meaning. Explaining how meaning can be part of the natural world. Because we've already actually already made quite a lot of progress with that. Twin Earth cases are really very powerful for thinking about these issues. I just want to try and bring that out. So right back at the very first lecture in this class, I was talking about the question, what makes it so that words have meaning? There's one world, it's a physical world, there's nothing in it but lots of atoms and so on governed by physical laws. How does it come about in such a world that the signs have meaning? How does it come about that the words refer to objects? And surely the facts about meaning can't be primitive the facts about meaning can't be irreducible facts about the world. Um, they must be explainable in terms of more basic facts. Um, we must be able to say how this phenomenon is happening, that there are um, um, sentences that are getting it right or wrong, that there is reference to objects. And if you say, well, of course, words have meaning because we associate mental images with them, our words have meaning because we give them meaning. Our culture, our psychologies give them meaning. It's the mind that breathes life into language. That's a very natural idea, and it's anyone's first reaction, I think, to the question. But um, it really doesn't help, because if you raise the question, well, uh, I can refer to the tree because I've got a mental image of a tree, then the next question is, how come your mental image is referring to the tree? How come you're able to think about the tree? And you just shuffle the problem one stage back if you appeal to the mind here. Uh, this is Putnam. Thought words and mental pictures do not intrinsically represent what they're about. That's to say, um, if you say, well, the, the word tree has the meaning it does, uh, because I associate a concept with it, some kind of word that runs through my head. Um, well, how come that word that runs through your head stands for a tree? What's going on there? How did that happen? Um, and similarly for mental pictures. And when you get that straight, you realize that you can't identify, you can't explain concepts in terms of any kind of mental object, because a concept is supposed to be something that intrinsically refers to an object, but nothing that's running through your head intrinsically refers to an object. There's got to be some way of explaining how this thing got connected up to the world. Well, you might be a kind of dualist here and say, well, maybe it's not, maybe it's kind of an exaggeration to say there's one world and it's a physical world. Maybe you might say, well, there are facts about meaning and reference, but um, everything is what it is and not another thing. You can't explain meaning and reference in terms of anything else. Um, but we really do want to understand how, how should I say, it's not magic that this happens. Um, surely we can explain how a world that entirely consists of whirling collections of molecules um, can have meaning and understanding in it. Um, we want, and the qu two questions here are, that we, as we framed it so far, are how is it that one part of the natural world can be about another? And 
How does it come about that there are standards of right and wrong in the natural world? So that's just to frame the question that we'll be uh, uh, looking at in the next three weeks or so. Is, that, is it clear what the question is? Not really. <laughs> I see. Okay. Uh, what part of... Um, Oops. What part of, we have to explain how meaning and understanding can be part of the natural world. What part of that don't you understand? Oh, you do get that part? Yeah. Oh, okay. But does everyone get that part? Okay. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> that's all I was trying to get over. Right? Um, is, is there something else? World, well, um, to explain how it is in a world that's uh, completely described by physics, in some sense physics gives you a complete description of the world. Yeah. If you said, you might say the world has many mansions. You see what I mean? That you might say, well, there's a realm of meaning, there's a realm of moral values, um, there's a realm of thoughts and sensations, and I don't have any puzzle about how these are all related. The trouble is we do seem to think that they're all related. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, so natural is really natural is something of the uh, 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 implication of the world is described by the natural sciences. Yeah. What could be plainer than that? You guys? Is there, is there anything plainer than that? <laughs> no. Okay. Okay? I, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, good. I mean, there's also sort of the thing that, I don't know, we can talk about in terms of, like, we can't drive off. Yeah, that's another way to put the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the right and wrong, in some sense, that's normative, right? You ought to say the right thing, you ought not to say the wrong thing. Something like that. Truth and falsity aren't. It's not like, I mean, positive charge and negative charge. Right? Sometimes you get a distinction that has no value to it. I mean, some, are, some uh, electrical charges are positive, some are negative. Um, it's not that the positive is better than the negative. I mean, <laughs> it's just a joke. If you say you're into the negative circuits, you really ought to try to be more positive. Um, that's, yes? You see what I mean? Um, um, or if a magnet has two poles, that's just a matter of indifference. Truth and falsity are not like that. When you form a belief, you're trying to get things right. When you make a statement, you're representing yourself as saying what's true. Yeah. So we aim at truth in a way we don't aim at falsity. And that seems to be part of what truth is, is what you aim at in belief and assertion. Um, but where did that come from? How did that happen? Yeah, if the world is just described by physics, then how can right and wrong have come in? I'm not sure if I need to keep explaining this or if you guys... Are, are you feeling reasonably comfortable with that? Yeah. Okay, now this looks like a hard question, but um, 20 half cases really make it seem like we're on the way already to addressing this. Remember the twin earth scenario? So you get earth with Oscar 1, you get twin earth with Oscar 2, um, and on uh, uh, the two Oscars have the same physical states, but they're in different physical surroundings in the two planets. So the words they use have different meanings. That's right. You, that's all right. You remember, you remember the twin earth cases. We, we are old stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that means, if that's right, that means you can do a factoring here. You can factor Oscar one and Oscar II's understanding of the words they are using into the bit that's inside the head and the bit that's outside their head. Um, the bit that's inside the head isn't enough to constitute understanding or meaning because Oscar I and Oscar II share that, but they nonetheless assign different meanings to the signs. Right? So the bit that's inside the head doesn't constitute meaning on its own. So there's got to be a second element, the bit that's different between Oscar I and Oscar II. That's the bit that's outside their head. Yes? 
I mean, are you, are you following me in the kind of arithmetic here? The, the, there are two bits. If, I mean, stop me if this gets too technical. There are two bits. There's a bit inside the head and a bit outside the head. Neither of them on their own are going to be enough for meaning. Because what's inside your, what's inside your head doesn't give you enough for meaning. What's outside your head doesn't give you enough for meaning. But stick them together and then you've got meaning. Yes? That's all right. So um, that shows you how you can start to analyze what understanding and meaning come to. Um, because you can look separately at the bit inside the head and the bit outside the head. So you can analyze meaning in terms of these two elements. The bit inside and the, something that's presumably causal or contextual or something like that. Something about what kind of environment you're in and how you're interacting with it. There is a bit outside the head. So we're on the way already, just by thinking about twin earth cases, to analyzing meaning and understanding. And it is a question, Putnam set up twin earth for uh, water and uh, names for natural kinds generally. So you might wonder, well, can you really generalize this? I mean, how far does it go? So we're going to, be, we're going to try. Uh, I, I, we are, just take my word for it, we are going to try this. Um, analyzing meaning in terms of these two components, the bit inside the head and the bit outside. Um, but there's a question how far you can take this, because there's a, there's a question, how far does the reach of twin earth cases go? And you're going to have twin earth cases for water, you're going to have twin earth cases for tigers. Um, what about um, terms referring to individual objects? Names like girdle, terms like that cup. Can you have twin earth cases for them? What do you think? Yes, yes, of course you can. Yes? I mean, here, here am I in twi on earth, here is my double and twin earth. We both use the name girdle, but we're referring to different people. Yes? Okay, what about um, artifacts like kettle or automobile? Yeah? Earth automobiles look very like twin earth automobiles, but in twin earth, they're plants. They're mobile plants. Yeah, they grow in greenhouses. Yeah. That could happen. Couldn't it? <laughs> Sorry? That could happen. Very good. Right. Look, kettles. Well, they could be plants too. Oh, yeah. Exactly. That's right. Um, um, and uh, they might be alive. You know, the twin earth kettles might talk. Right? I mean, we wouldn't be able to hear them, if you see what I mean, but they might talk to each other or to the teapot. Or, you see what I mean? Uh, you can imagine it being quite different in Earth and Twin Earth. What about colors or shapes? We talked about that a little bit. Colors? The colors all look just the same in Twin Earth, but not, not really the same. Yes, if you've got locks, kind of picture that could happen. Different kind of spectral reflectances, different physics producing the color appearances. Ah, uh, that's right. Physics is the same everywhere. Oh, but what, but what I mean is, um, those those color appearances in twin earth are being caused by different physical characteristics of the object. You, you see what I mean? The basic physical laws are just the same, but it's just that the kinds of light reflectances you get in twin earth are different to the kinds of light reflectances you get on earth. Though the upshot for us in our inner life is just the same. Yeah. So it can go quite far, right? The the possibility of twin earth cases. What about social relations? What about friendship and love? Could it be different in Earth? It seems just the same in Earth and in Twin Earth. But um, really, the, the real thing you're talking about is actually quite different. On Earth, love has to do with what goes on in your amygdala. On uh, Twin Earth, love has to do with what goes on in your frontal cortex. Um, yeah, feels just the same. There's quite different brain states. Yeah, yeah. An airplane or a kettle? Yep. It couldn't really work from mud. Yeah. Yes. Like 
Yes. That's right. It's just uh, yeah. It wouldn't stop being an airplane in the earth sense if it was made of different stuff. Okay. Right. That's very good. Yeah. Um, um, I think there's actually room for a lot of argument about certainly the last three lines there. E each of them. I think there's a, a first pass case you can make. Yeah. And what is what I'm trying to make. But then you go back and look at it in detail. Um, is, is, is not so clear, so I, I, for just the kind of reason you're giving. Um, the reason I said something living is that if it's an artifact, I mean, I think, I think that the way we use kettle or aeroplane is it something we made, it's something we made to meet our purposes. You see what I mean? Whether it's a kettle or a car or an aeroplane um, isn't a matter of uh, can you actually boil water in it? I mean, for the kettle, yeah. yeah. Um, because you might not be able to boil water in it, but that's just because it's not a very good kettle. But if, <laughs> if you see what I mean, right? Uh, but um, there's something about the idea that, well, the reason it was made in the first place was so you could boil water in it. That has to be true for it to be a kettle. Something like that. But if these things are plants, then the reason they were made in the first place was not so you could boil water in them. Or if they're alive, then they have their own purposes. Yeah. So it's not just that it's made of different stuff, it has a different function. You see what I mean? They are things that we are using as kettles, but they're not really kettles. Yeah. Let's suppose they're alive, right? But we don't realize they're alive. They work on a very slow time scale um, and very quietly. <laughs> and, yeah. So they talk to each other and to the other artifacts and to an earth, but humans never realize any of this. Yeah. But they have their own lives and their own designs. Yeah. They're not actually made in factories, though everybody supposes that they are. That's right, they call them kettles. But they, don't use them to boil water. they do use them to boil water, yeah. They haven't realized that they're not really, ca that um, that's not their function. <laughs> Maybe this isn't going to work. <laughs> um, let me think about this. Um, no, they'd say um, when the truth came out, yeah, when someone exposed the scandal of the so-called kettle factories, they'd say, my God, we all this time we thought kettles were artifacts made by us. But it turns out that kettles are alive. Right? That could happen. That could happen here. But I, I just, I still don't, I, I don't see that <laughs> That's right. They'd be inclined to, yeah, if when you made that discovery, you'd say, yeah, they're still kettles. That's right. But we, if, okay, so if that's what happens in Twin Earth, right, they make this shocking discovery. Yeah. We are going to say, well, what they got in Twin Earth isn't a kettle, you must understand. They call it kettles. They call them kettles. Well, they're not really kettles. They're not kettles like our kettles. Yeah. I mean, they Yeah. You certainly want to make a distinction between our kettles and what they call kettles. Yeah. Um, okay. I, this is fine. I don't want to go. This is really meant to be a kind of exercise. A tri uh -huh, very good. Well, couldn't. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, couldn't the basic physics of Earth and Twin Earth be different? So that, you know, when you've got a rigid triangle or structure on Earth, yeah, this, uh, um, then. I mean, triangles are a very stable physical structure. Yeah, you use them in bridges and all that, right? Because you can't move a triangle as easy as you can a square or something. Yeah. So um, suppose that on twin Earth, the basic, I mean, you're, you're right when you say physics applies everywhere, but really there are local force fields and um, I, I don't really have the technical vocabulary to explain it properly, <laughs> but um, the, um, you're in a sector of the universe where the basic forces governing everything that goes on are really quite different. So the basic physical upshot is quite different. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. I'm not saying this really works. <laughs> right? I, I want to make a first pass question, right? 
and say there really is an issue here and it's not obvious. How much depth you can get out of any of these questions is not clear to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you want to? Yeah. Okay, so you're happy. I mean, I mean I'll, I'll try and look up some of the. <laughs> you're equally unhappy. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes, right. Maths are the same, right? Right. Right. Very good. Um, th there is a r th th there are real issues here. I'm not, I, I don't. Uh, I don't. <laughs> on the one hand, I don't want to spend too long on it, but I don't, on the other hand, I don't want to just brush it aside either, because these are real questions. Um, um, with geometry, though, there's a distinction between pure and applied geometry, right? So, um, ge pure geometry presumably is going to be just the same in every possible world. Applied geometry, that's what I meant about how the triangle is rigid. Um, applied geometry seems more like an empirical uh, th thing about what happens to be the case in the actual world. Y yeah. So, that'll be the first pass answer. The, the next pass is can we really make sense of alternative applied geometries? Um, which is, yeah, which is a good question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes? When you're moving from one, oh, oh, you, you mean like a spot case or a Madagascar case, a reference shift case. Um, straight off, it's not. You can turn it into a reference shift case by supposing someone who travels backwards and forwards between Earth and twin Earth, yeah? So it can become a reference shift case. Um, so what you'd be saying is if the kettles in twin Earth are quite different to the kettles here, then as you move backwards and forwards slowly, the, the dominant source of your information relating to kettles will shift on Earth that was the artifact and twin Earth that was the, the, the living creature, yeah? Um, so that dominant source will shift, so it will, you could turn it into a reference shifting case. Is, is that what you mean? That's right. That's right. It is a different. That's right. Does that shift the meaning? Uh, is that a way of thinking how the meaning is different? Yes. Well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the, you've got the picture. That what's inside the head is just the same. What's outside the head is changing, and as that changes, your reference changes. Yeah? And what that shows is that meaning can't be identified with entirely with what's inside the head. Yeah. Yep? Yes. Yeah. You might say, well, John is John. Well, that's not necessarily true. Right. John, John never to people. Yes. So it seems to me that in that case, the difference in meaning is more the issue of water on Twin Earth and water on Earth. Maybe the signs aren't quite sophisticated enough to express that. So it's just, you know, uh, that's not an, an unreasonable way to put it. Uh, I mean, Frege said in a perfect language, each sign would be associated with just one sense. Yeah. And that's a way of expressing it. I'm going to count words. So if there's a different meaning associated with them, that's a different word. Yeah. And you might try and make that explicit by saying, by adding a subscript or saying, well, in this sense or something. Um, uh, that's perfectly fine. But the, the only thing there is that it's a very rich notion of same word you're using. Uh, as you say, it's not just the sound or the shape. It's, you're appealing to facts to do with the meaning or the reference to explain what you mean by same so the same word. That's right. You're, you, you're basically accepting his point by saying, in that situation, I'm going to call these different words. But well, it yeah. Seems like the word is not um, fixed by the external stuff. Or, yeah, it's not really fixed by the external stuff because they're different words. You have different baptisms in um, 
Oh, do you mean the causal history of the word is different? Uh huh. Okay, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, you could say um, the word water has a long and rich history in the English language, and in, over there it will have a long and rich, hi rich history in twin English. Yep. Um, so they are different words. Okay, th that's fair enough. You could count words that way, and that, that's different to counting them in terms of their meanings. That's counting them in terms of things like their own causal origins as words, you know, looking back into etymological history. Um, uh, that's fair enough, but in that sense, um, difference of word is no barrier to the two words having the same meaning. You could have different words in earth and in twin earth, but they could mean exactly the same. That's right, that's right. But me, it's, it's not the mere difference of word that implies that. I'm going to give an example in a moment, okay? So, um, I say you can have twin earth cases whenever there's lookalikes, right? As you can have something that looks just like a kettle or an airplane, but isn't really a kettle or an airplane, then you can have a twin earth case where the lookalikes have... Um, uh, what's the word I want? Triumphed um, have, um, are in the majority. Yeah? You see what I mean? On Earth, you've got regu the regular thing, and you've got a few lookalikes. On Twin Earth, is mostly what we call lookalikes. Yeah, so you can always set up a Twin Earth case when there's lookalikes. So I think the clear stop point here will be words for psychological sensations. Uh, terms like headache. You've got a headache in Earth, and you've got a headache in Twin Earth. Well, if they feel just the same, if they're lookalikes for headaches in that twin earth, then those really are headaches. I mean, there's no more to a headache than the way it feels. So if it feels just the same way, then it is a headache. It's really a headache. So I think the thing about ringers just comes, so far as I can see anyway, the thing about ringers comes to a definite stop with words for headaches or, yeah, a pang of, uh, a yen, a pang or a throb of bliss, um, uh, if these feel just the same and Earth isn't twin Earth, then they are just the same. Yep. Yeah. Right, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Our old friend, Platonin, absolutely, is yes, right. Um, yeah, I, the, the, I agree that could happen. But remember, the word here is not a word for the physical basis of the thing. We're talking about the sensation itself, not its physical basis. So it's true that, the word for the, that if you're referring to the physical basis, that could vary between Earth and Twin Earth. But what, what you're doing when you talk about the, um, the, the feeling is you're, talking, you're trying to peel off the sensation produced by that underlying basis. And that's the thing that you can't make sense of it varying. I mean, well, sorry. So you would say Oscar 1 and Oscar 2 are both feeling bliss. It just yeah. happens that Oscar 1 is feeling bliss because of serotonin and the other is better. Exactly. It's the same feeling, yeah. So, I mean, when we're actually talking about words that stand for stuff that's inside the head, then varying the context isn't going to matter. That's the idea. So ju just, ju just to r round out, p in that situation, pain and earth and pain and twin earth would be different words, or headache and er to earth and headache and twin earth would be different words because their historical uh, roots are different, but um, they would still be standing for exactly the same thing. They'd both be talking about the same inner sensation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Right. All right. The, the, that's a way of picking up that thing about serotonin and platotonin. Yeah. Right. Um, and we could use headache like that. But what I say is we don't. Um, and he, 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 here's my claim that, um, yeah, I mean, suppose you go to the dentist and the dentist says, 
I know this, uh, getting this root canal work ordinarily produces a great deal of pain. Um, but um, actually, we've got a way of doing it so it doesn't feel pain. Yeah? And um, th th then he does his thing, and you experience the agonies of the damned. And um, you, you, uh, you, you say, I don't know what you're talking about. And he says, no, no, look, medical science has shown. Um, we have you in the scanner the whole time. What's, what's underlying this is not C fiber firing. It feels like pain, but it's actually just a look-alike. It's not C fiber firing. Yeah, you see what I mean? Yeah. It seems the exact opposite of the actual Well, that's what I mean. I, th I think it is the exact opposite. Yeah, because in this case, we're only talking about how it seems, not the thing out there. Yeah. I think you can apply this to the water thing if you think that the psychological is associated with that, not meaning the word water, but rather the feeling of like being quenched. Yes. Okay, you could, you, could, you could say something watery or something like that, the watery stuff. Yeah, meaning the stuff that gives me that kind of a thirst quenching sensation. Is, is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. That's right. That's right. Okay, the, 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 that's fine. Uh, the, 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 um, uh, uh, the, the, the only thing here is you need the distinction between the words that, as you were saying, um, are pointing to the essence, pointing to the, to the molecular structure or whatever it is, and the words that aren't doing that, the words that are just talking about your own inner life. Yeah? Okay, and I agree with uh, a, a, a number of the questions that there's a, a kind of grey area where, uh, the, the, I mean, these cases really are more difficult. But, on the fi but they're not like the sensations. I guess that's the only thing I want to say. It's not quite as clear for them as for the sensations that um, you can't have ringers and lookalikes in uh, 20 earth cases. Yep. Yep. Yes. Um, it seems like that's just a special case about um, psychological sensations because they're just in the head. That's right. It is a special thing about psychological sensations. Yeah. I don't see how that lends itself to saying that um, that when we have something like water or something external to the head, um, our mind. Yeah. Well, in the sense in which you're using word, there are different words for X, Y, Z, and H2O. That's fine. Um, my, my point is only that sameness of word in itself is, sorry, difference of word in itself is consistent with sameness of meaning. And if that wasn't true, then um, translation from one language to another would be completely impossible. Yeah, I mean, w words in French have a different um, history to words in English. Yeah, they're different words. But the whole idea in translation is you try and match them up with words uh, to, to the, so you get the same meanings. Yeah? And I, I don't say that's easy, but the idea is that in principle it's possible. And there seem to, yeah? Uh, I mean, it, it would be just a mistake if you said to someone, you know, a UN translator or someone. And, uh, but you realize the whole mistake you're making is that these are different words. <laughs> that, <that's laughs> that, that can't be a barrier to finding sameness of meaning. Yeah. Um, is fixed by something other than what's in, or at least it is not solely by what's in the head. That's right. So that there are different words um, seems to defeat the whole purpose because they have different meanings. Well, obviously, because they're different words. Putnam's argument seems to rest on the assumption that water on twin earth and water on earth is the same word, and that the meaning is different on twin earth and earth because you have differences of. That's how I always okay. The question is, what determines the meaning of the word? Is it its etymological history? Um, and the thing is, that's completely parallel in the two situations. Is it what's inside the head? Not that either. Um, so, I mean, I think exact similarity of word, even if we don't have the very same word in your sense, is enough for him to make his point. I mean, it's a very fine distinction you're drawing. <laughs> okay, let, come back to this. Okay. Um, okay.
Um, so I'm saying since there's no problem of lookalikes for sensations, you can't have twin earth cases for sensations. That's where the twin earth thing stops. Is that all right? Um, uh, you don't have any causal or contextual determinants of meaning for sensation. Names for sensations. Yeah? Because they, they just are about what's inside your head. Um, so if Oscar 1 and Oscar 2 swapping places, they, they, they couldn't tell. Well, they're just going to have that. That is what it is to have the same sensations. But it's possible that it's only sensations that are exempt from the possibility of twin earth cases. I mean, we've already discussed a little bit. I, I, I hope I've managed to convey my sense that in these other cases, it's difficult to be sure which way it goes. And that's all I really want to say at the moment. Okay, but maybe for all other terms that are causal or contextual determinants of meaning, and then we can get on, on to the program of explaining all meaning in terms of um, what's inside the head plus those causal or contextual determinants, leaving problem of sensation as a special case. Okay? Okay. But at this point, the refutation of skepticism is very straightforward. Okay. Ready? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who laughed? <laughs> I promise you it's very straightforward. Look, consider classical skepticism. Um, when you're asked, might it all not all be a dream? Um, might you not be a brain in a vat? Uh, when you think about the... I, I mean, my impression is a lot of you guys have encountered Descartes in some way or another. But you know the idea. It might all be a dream. Um, an evil neuroscientist might be tampering with my brain. Um, what you're asking in all these skeptical cases is, are the causes of my experiences what I take them to be? Right? What, what the skeptic does is they say, look, there are lots of ways that uh, your experiences could be being caused that aren't by tables and uh, other people and um, the lights and the blackboard and so on. You, you could be having just the experiences you're having right now, but that could be all just productions of a heat oppressed brain, an evil demon, madness, an evil scientist with electrodes plugged into your brain. Or maybe all there is in the whole universe is a large vat with lots of brains bobbing about in it and some vat tending machinery to keep the brains properly irrigated. Right? So when you think about it, <laughs> some of you are looking quite pained. <laughs> so when you think about it, these are all causal hypotheses. These are all ways of saying my, um, my inner life doesn't have the kind of causal context that I think it does. It's not other people in tables and chairs and so on. Um, it's all this different stuff. So skepticism is saying maybe the causes of our thoughts are quite different to what we take them to be. And in that case, most of our thoughts would be false. That's the, yeah, that's the whole thing of a, of a skeptical hypothesis. That's what goes on in the meditations. Descartes gives you all these alternative causes and then says, well, how do you know it's not that one? But the whole assumption there is you can hold steady the contents of your thoughts while varying uh, what their causes are. Right? So you know what thoughts you're having. The thoughts you're having are one thing. What's making you have those thoughts? That's quite another so I think that what's make, I take it that what's making me have thoughts about people and tables and chairs and so on right now is a whole bunch of people and tables and chairs. And the skeptic says, well, as it were, hold those thoughts. You can hold those thoughts fixed, but something else might be causing you to have all those thoughts. That tending machinery, for example, might be what's causing you to have those thoughts rather than the tables and chairs and so on. So... Through these skeptical hypotheses, you're supposed to keep steady the element inside the head. But the trouble is that the whole point about these twin earth cases is that what we already agreed is that what this stuff inside the head is about, what you're representing, depends on causal or contextual factors. So if you vary the causes of someone's thoughts, you vary what they're representing. So if you varied what's causing someone to have their thoughts, you will change what thoughts they're having. And actually, when you think about it, 
the subject's going to come out as holding true beliefs if you just vary the causes. The whole point so far has been that it's your causal relations to your surroundings that are generating the standards of rightness and wrongness. Yeah? Starting with Kripke, that's been the whole thrust. It's those causal connections to what's around you that set the standards of rightness and wrongness. So you can't just, as a skeptic says, vary the causal connections to your surroundings, but keep steady the standards of rightness and wrongness. So here's Putnam. When brain's in a vat, when a brain in a vat has an image of a tree, the brain in the vat is not thinking about real trees. How could it be thinking about real trees? It couldn't be thinking about real trees any more than it could be thinking about you or me. It never encountered a real tree. It never saw a real tree in its life. It was born in a vat. There are no trees in the vat, right? So it couldn't be thinking about a real tree. It never met you or me. It couldn't be thinking about you or me. It might have images. There might be structures in its brain that are just like the structures in your or my brain when we are thinking about trees. But whatever's going on, it can't be thinking about a tree because it doesn't have that causal connection to trees. Can't be thinking about Gödel. It never was causally connected. Never met, never met Gödel. Never met anyone who met Gödel. Never met anyone who was in any way causally connected to Gödel. Yeah? It just lived its whole life in the vat. So, what is it representing? Well, when it uses the word tree, um, that will be in response to some activity in the vat-tending machinery. And it's not causally disconnected to its environment. That's the whole thing about the skeptical hypothesis, right? That um, you explain how there could be some alternative causes for your thoughts and the current ones. So the vat-tending, there's going to be some pattern of activity in the vat-tending machinery that makes it produce the word tree. Just as for you or me, the regular cause of uh, our producing the word tree is, well, the presence of a tree. I mean, <laughs> assuming that you have this, we all have this kind of rudimentary conversation where you go around the campus saying, tree! Um, <laughs> right. But something like that. Um, uh, so when the brain in the, bat, in the vat says, lo, a tree, then... Just as you or I would characteristically be responding to a tree, the brain in the vat is responding to some kind of pattern of activity in the vat tending machinery. And that's what it's talking about. Yep. Right. Uh, 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 that, that's possible. I mean, it, that might happen to us that um, we could find that there isn't any one thing out there that we're talking about when we say trees. It's just a wild bunch of different stuff. Um, but um, uh, how should I say? We, we, we do operate in some assumption of regularity in our environment. Yeah. It operates in that kind of assumption too. Let's suppose for the moment that that kind of assumption is met. Yeah. In that case, is talking about the presence of those um, electrical impulses in the brain. I mean, how should I put it? I, I, I do want to come back to this kind of point. I think, I think this is important. But it's also important to remember that the objection to the skeptical hypothesis was never, um, ah, but suppose the VAT is unsystematic. Uh, you see what I mean? And how it produces these, these things, yeah? Um, if that really turns out to matter, we're a long way down the path. Yeah, so let's get to why it matters uh, uh, first. Um, so suppose then, if in that case, if we've got the characteristic signature of electrical impulses in the vat that are causing the brain to produce the sign tree, then um, it's, what does its production of the sign tree stand for? What's it talking about when it says tree? Class, is the brain then talking about trees. No, it is not talking about trees. It never saw a tree. Is it talking about the presence 
of um, that elect electronic signature in the VAT tending machinery. Yes, that's what it's causally responsive to. That's what fixes the reference of its term. That's the whole point. It's a causal connection that fixes the reference of the term. Is there such a thing as that? Uh, so when it says low a tree, it's referring to the presence of that electronic pattern. Is that electronic pattern happening? Yes. Is the brain therefore right when it says low a tree? Yes. Wow. Okay. So on causal theories of reference, the brain is right, not wrong, when it thinks there is a tree in front of me. Yeah. And that's general. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, in order for our science to have meaning, there must be that world out there. Okay. Um, doesn't it seem like um, that he... Isn't, isn't it more that he's saying uh, if we were to be bent in the back, then we couldn't talk about being bent in the back in... But he's not saying the stronger case that we are not bent in the because still think or not that there is in the physical world that we get back. If we, especially if we were bent in the back, then it certainly wouldn't be thinking. I, I know what you mean, but it's really very hard to get this across competently because what you're agreeing with, I think, and what he's saying is that um, when you use the sentence, I'm a brain and a vat, you're saying something false. Because brain, remember, if you, <laughs> if you were in um, this scenario, yeah, uh, in which that is your sentence you utter and you're coming out, it's coming out true, then... You, there's also going to be your use of the word brain. Yeah? What will your use of the word brain refer to? Will your use of the word brain refer to brains? No! You never encounter a brain in your life. It, you, your use of the word brain will refer to um, um, particular patterns of activity in the vat tending machinery. Are you identical to that pattern of vat activity in the vat tending machinery? No! So when you say, I am a brain in a vat, that comes out false. Yep. So, it doesn't matter. It seems to be saying that we. Well, I, I don't know that I am like. Okay. So, I, I see pictures of brains and things, and I say, oh, these are what, is, what are inside me, and um, I have, um, like, in virtue of which I can say that there are actually brains in this world that are not in bats and things like yes. that. Yes. Right? The brain will use those very words too and say something true using them. Okay, we're going to go on with this for the next two sessions. I, I really just want to make one last point because we're on the hour. Okay, remember in the case of Earth and Twin Earth, we said, okay, you've got this, this is what's going on in your inner life on Earth. This is what's going on in your inner life on Twin Earth. Yeah, but um, we interpret them differently because of the context. Yes? So what you're saying in Earth comes out true and what you're saying in Earth com Twin Earth comes out true and it works just the same. Yeah, I mean, it's tr true in both cases, even though the meaning is different. Yes? So that's all right. That's, that's reasonably unproblematic. Yeah? Well, all you're doing now is substituting the vat for twin earth. Yeah, the vat is just another twin earth. What's going on inside your mind is just the same. What's going on in the context is different. So we just reinterpret the meanings of the signs so that everything you're saying comes out true. So you borrow for twin earth, you should be buying it for the VAT too. So we have answered the skeptic. And on that bombshell, <laughs> um, <laughs> we will talk about this for another couple more sessions. Okay.